YouTube. My goal in this video is to continue a long overdue dialogue with a YouTube user named Richie3622. Um, it's long overdue because there's almost been a year between our discussion, so he may or may not even be on YouTube anymore. But so, as some of you may know, I've been taking a break, and so I've had a lot more time to allocate to thinking and writing, and so I would like to continue this dialogue with this YouTube user. Now, approximately one year ago, I watched a video from this user who uh, made four to five arguments against um, God. Specifically, he argued that as such, your ticket into atheism is not proving whether or not gods exist. It's proving God isn't worth believing in. Now, specifically, he brought up two main objections. The fatalistic argument and a soriological argument from evil. Now, my response to Ritchie included an analysis of these points and a few others. For example, um, there were some peripheral ideas of the design inference, the historicity of the Bible, the attributes of God, etc. But my plan here is to focus on Ritchie's two, uh, two main arguments once again. But I would quickly like to respond to his five statements and his counter-arguments in the description section, so those will be there. Now, first, Ritchie continues to defend his contention in his video response to me that foreknowledge denies freedom. He states, don't mix your use of contingent with mine. I failed to see how foreknowledge doesn't make something necessary. If there were any possibility of a different outcome, then it wouldn't be foreknowledge. It would be a judgment in probability, end quote. That started at about 5 minutes, 40 seconds. Now, it would be good to keep three things in mind from my original response. First, I originally argued that people's choices are contingent events and not necessary events via God's omniscience. This means that the truth behind X will be an atheist is either true or false, but is not necessarily true or false. Thus, the fatalistic argument doesn't work, and I'll expound on that in a second again. I argued this via Occam's thoughts on the subject as developed by Alvin Plantinga. Second, I pointed out that Ritchie was committing a modal fallacy by confusing the necessity of the inference from the necessity of the consequent. In other words, what follows from premise 1 and 2 is not the necessity of Ritchie's atheism, but merely that Ritchie will be an atheist because Ritchie's atheism, given God's foreknowledge, is contingent and not necessary. Third, I stated that a necessary truth ought to be defined as follows, a truth that is impossible to be false, and a possible truth that should be defined as a contingent truth, or in other words, a truth that could be true or could be false. Now, this is the standard way in which contingent and necessary are defined in the standard works in philosophy, such as the Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy. This work defines the two terms as follows. Necessity is a modal property attributed to a whole proposition just when it is not possible that the proposition be false, and contingent is neither impossible nor necessary, i.e. both possible and not necessary. Thus, Richie's charge of equivocation, or perhaps taken another way, his charge that there are different definitions of these two terms in logic, are simply unfounded. In addition, this argument fatalism has to be wrong, because fatalism posits a constraint upon human freedom which is completely unintelligible. You see, God's knowledge is not thought to be the cause of what will happen in the future. The claim is not that God's knowing about something causes something to happen. The event itself may be internally uncaused. It may be a free event, or it may be a quantum event that is completely causally undetermined. So if the event is causally indeterminate, then how can God's merely knowing about an event constrain it in any way? Consider, for example, an event X in the future that has not happened and is uncaused. The fatalist would say this event is constrained by foreknowledge. But consider for a moment that God does not have foreknowledge that X will occur. What's changed? Well, X is still the same uncaused event. God doesn't know about it, and all of a sudden the constraints is supposed to have just vanished. It happened contingently. But whether God knows about it or not is just causally irrelevant to whether X occurs. So what is the constraint? For example, suppose you have an infallible barometer. The infallible, an infallible barometer will tell you which way the weather will be, but the barometer does not determine the weather. The weather determines the barometer. From the barometer's reading, you will know how the weather will be. But the barometer isn't what determines the weather. Or consider another example. Suppose the best football team plays the worst. 
Now everyone who is watching, whether they be there or on TV, knows the outcome. But how does the knowledge cause the event to happen? Now one may object here and say that the knowledge of those people is probability and God's knowledge is more certain. However, this does not detract at all since certainty is a property of persons and not propositions. Propositions are either necessary or contingently true or false or false given contingency. It is people who are certain. So whether you have a certain knowledge or not, this is just a sort of psychological state. It is not a property of the proposition itself. So concisely, we can't make the mistake of confusing foreknowledge with foreordination. Moreover, Ritchie's charge that foreknowledge destroys human volition and that the mere possibility of different choices renders foreknowledge as a probability judgment either ignores or misunderstands the logical argument now given twice via Occam and seems to introduce the idea of middle knowledge. Given middle knowledge, we could answer this problem another way. God knows the range of all free choices prior to the moment of creation, thus he sovereignly knows our choices yet we have the freedom to act on those free choices. Now, these are two ways in which we can argue the fatalistic argument. Now, this segues nicely into the second main objection. Ritchie presses his argument that hell is unjustified here. He states, quote, You completely missed the point of the argument, which was to question whether the punishment of sin is justified, end quote. Now, from my understanding, Richie is, Richie is establishing the argument off the fact that God knows who will freely refuse him, yet makes them anyway. William Lane Craig and his application of the Molinist framework via middle knowledge have recently provided an answer to this question in the philosophical literature. Let me quickly detail Craig's answer. Craig argues that there are three conditions that are true. One, there are some possible persons who would not freely receive Christ under any circumstances given free will. Two, there is no possible world in which all persons would freely receive Christ. And three, God holds that a world in which some persons freely reject Christ, but the number of those who freely receive him is maximized, is preferable to a world in which all, a few people receive Christ and none are lost. Now, Craig supports condition number one by arguing that God cannot guarantee that all will receive Christ given the endowment of free will of humanity and human volition. Moreover, since God cannot force someone to freely choose him, free will seems to dictate that there will be a set of individuals in every possible world that refuse to freely receive Christ. Thus, it is argued that condition one holds. Craig supports condition number two as follows. It may not be possible to create just those persons, i.e. the exclusive set and subset of believers without the lost and just the right circumstances for all to be saved. Why? It may well be that if God changes the circumstances that allow, let's say, Smith to freely trust Christ, then this alternation may bring it about that Jones will freely reject Christ, even though Jones would have accepted Christ, in a world without the circumstances needed to bring Smith to a saving faith. Thus all our lives are intricately connected, and given human free volitional choice, two seems to hold. Craig then argues that three, holds as well. He says that the actual world is such a world and it inherently contains an optimal balance between saved and unsaved. And those who are unsaved would never have received Christ under any circumstances. Thus, concisely, via God's omniscience, which contains natural, middle, and free knowledge, God knows exactly what individuals will choose via their free will before creation, then selected the optimal balance world, wherein three holds. This is one answer to Ritchie's objection in question. However, again, it seems that his argument hinges on the idea that God forces people to hell via some deterministic mechanism ruled by his foreknowledge. Given that this was argued against via two systems of thought, i.e. Occam and Molinism, I don't see that God is not worth believing in. Peace.